Hello and welcome back to the online conference brought to you by Smithsonian Education. We're of course focusing on Abraham Lincoln and we are delighted to have you here. We've been looking at uh, all of your contributions to the discussion areas that are on the site as well as uh, to all of these live events and I hope you've noticed as we have what an incredibly diverse set of perspectives people are bringing to this conference uh, both in terms of where you are geographically as well as where you are in your lives. Some of you are teachers and students, teachers and students. We have people who just have a lifelong interest in Abraham Lincoln and history and in, uh, and in uh, American uh, culture and art and science. So we do encourage you to continue letting us know about yourselves and your interest and uh, also offering some tips for other people, um, facts that you might have encountered, some of the results of your own research perhaps access you've had to primary sources that we've been looking at. So please do continue to share in the discussion area. I'll also point out that we're recording today's sessions and all the sessions so far in this conference that have taken place are in the recording area. We want to hear from you during the session, so please be sure to use that chat box with your questions. And we're going to ask to um, have you share some ideas with us at a, a few points during this next session. You're going to really enjoy this next topic. Um, the topic is on public and private photography during the Civil War. And I think you're going to look at images and at history a, a different way after hearing from Shannon Thomas Parrish, who's Associate Curator at the National Museum of American History. And so it gives me great pleasure to turn the floor over to Shannon. Thanks, Jonathan. How's my lipstick? Do I look good? <laughs> <laughs> you look great. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining me today. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, this is an astonishing range of visitors to this website and participants in this web conference. It's so exciting to be able to reach uh, out to so many people and share the collections in the photographic history collection at the National Museum of American History. I have a couple of goals today um, that I want you to go away with. Uh, I want you to know that photographs are more than illustrations, especially for those who are using textbooks and are always wondering, what do I do with the photographs that are in my textbooks? I hope that you go away with some strategies for being able to interpret those photographs and use them as jumping off points to expand your researches. And I also want you to know, this might seem a little bit catty, but I also want you to know that Brady was not the only Civil War era photographer. Brady was an amazing photographer and he was prolific. His materials are readily accessible and so he gets distributed widely. But I also want you to know that there are other materials out there beyond Matthew Brady. As so many of you know, the Civil War didn't just start in 1861. It started years before. And in the photographic history collection, we have these three photographs. We have Daniel Webster and Henry Clay and Sam Houston. And all of these men were photographed by a DC area photographer named Julian Vanerson, right here in DC. And he modeled himself after Matthew Brady so that people could come into his studio and see who the important people were in Washington, DC. So these three were important because they were part of the Compromise of 1850. So what I'm hoping to do today is to share with you this idea that the Civil War didn't just happen on a large national scale, that it happened in people's lives, and to attach faces and voices to various opinions and thoughts and ideas so that you have an opportunity to expand the ways in which we get into and understand the Civil War. You're looking at the cover of the Rutgers, uh, a yearbook from Rutgers College, which is in New Jersey. And this is from the class of 1860. So just as today's yearbooks, just as you do with your yearbooks and you have your friends and teachers sign them, the same happened here in 1860. The autographs and photographs. And the yearbook belonged to a guy named George W. McNeil. He was in the class of 1860, one of 15 students graduating that year, and he was a Texan. So the question is, what is a Texan doing in New Jersey? And what are people going to write to him? And what messages are they going to send back with him? So here is his theology professor, 
uh, Professor Van Vranken, and he writes, the Patriot's heart takes in his whole country. Another theology professor, Theodore Strong, here he writes about the most important thing is the glorious Constitution. I won't read the whole thing to you, but he writes about the taking this message back to the, to the South, that the North is part of the Union, uh, the South is part of the Union, and they want everything to stay together. Here's a classmate writing something similar. My Southern friend, when we have finished our college course and you have gone to your Southern home, remember that you are a citizen of a great republic. As such, be loyal and countenance no schemes of personal and sectional aggrandizement. Tell your friends and neighbors that from your certain knowledge there is a great conservative union-loving people at the North, that they look upon our country as one country and never will consent to its dissolution. Tell them how a Froiling Heisen, that was the president of the university, pleads their rights and teaches his students to uphold the Constitution and the laws. Your classmate, William Brownlee Vorheis, Reddington, New Jersey. And we have Friend McNeil, that you may live to see all abolitionists turned to dust and the Union saved is the wish of your friend and classmate, D. Abel Williamson, 1860, Plan Dome, New Jersey. So what you have here is a variety of voices, a variety of opinions, and an opportunity to dissect. You, you know, you can go back and use these texts and use these faces to make the point that there's a, a northern opinion, but within that northern opinion there are a variety of ways of restating their positions. And I think it'd make a very interesting dis discussion to try to interpret what does it mean uh, that you may live to see all ab abolitionists turn to dust. I'm scooting through this first part a little quickly if it seems like I'm hurrying along. I'm excited about the, um, what we're going to talk about in the middle and the activity we're going to do in the middle of this presentation. So um, I'm just going to move right ahead. The fun thing I want to tell you about this album is that the photographer himself is in the yearbook. A guy named uh, George K. Warren, who was a Boston area photographer, invented the concept of the yearbook. And here he is writing to McNeil, photographically, I am yours, my dear McNeil, George Kendall Warren. Now, War we have a huge Warren collection in the photographic history collection. Here I'm showing you the back of the yearbook, and it says George W. McNeil, Texas. Uh, it'd be a great activity to decode this, this um, embossing in the back with George Washington in the middle. It's a very patriotic symbol. Right, so back to George K. Warren in the large collection that we have. Um, he made this transition from daguerreotype photography to paper processes, and pap the paper process was so much about reproduction and selling this uh, single image multiple times. And one of the things that really made these businesses successful was the ability to sell carte de visites and put them in albums. So I'm getting ready to show you one of Warren's personal albums. But here you can see a carte de visite, which is a photograph about the size of a business card that has an image on it. The woman sitting here is holding a carte de visite album in her lap. And there are four, let me grab my pointer here, there are four pictures. You can see them one, two, whoops. Oh, there we go. There's <laughs> one, two, whoops, a little higher maybe. Can you see them? There's four there. It's an interesting image if you think about why would she take a photo album to the studio? Why would she be photographed with them? There's two small children here. Where's the man? Um, is he gone? Are they remembering him? Are they bringing his pictures to the album, uh, to the studio so that they might all be photographed together? I don't know. Here's the top of the album, and I want to show you the that there are four little holes. There's uh, here. Let me grab my pointer one more time. There's one in each of the diamonds here, and right there in front of the brass hinge, there's another one. And there used to be little bumpers or little feet that would be there, so that the al album wouldn't sit directly on the table. Which I'm telling you this because it raises an interesting point of condition. Condition is so much a part of looking at an object, a photographic object, and using that information to um, using that information to help inform you how the photograph was used. Was it loved? Was it not loved? Was it in a fire? Was it water damaged? That sort of thing. So in the album there are generals, there are family, there are friends. 
And on the right you have General N.P. Banks, that would be General Nathaniel Prentice Banks. And he was Warren's brother-in-law. And in the collection we have loose carte de visites. So on the left you have Emma. She's General Banks' nurse, and that's a nurse as in one who took care of children. Think of Nana and Peter in the pan, uh, Peter Pan. And you have also Banks's brothers. On the upper right is, let me make sure I get his name right here for you, <clears throat> is Hiram Banks. And on the back of the card, it says he belonged to the 16th Massachusetts Company, number 11. Lost in battle and never found. His brother, General Banks, got permission to look for his body, but after five days' search, they gave up. And on the bottom is Gardner Banks, the brother of General Banks. After war, he bought a cotton plantation. So it might be that Emma came up from the cotton plantation to work for General Banks. It may be that she has nothing to do with the cotton plantation. We don't really know anything about her. But what I want to show you here is an opportunity again to talk about the poignancy of the Civil War having a very direct effect on individuals. We can go back and we can look at at General Banks and his career. He was a senator before he joined the Army and became a major general. Um, but he also was very affected by the war. And, and, uh, Shannon, yeah, a number of people, including uh, Melanie Lane, have noted really what, you, you're, you're, what you're saying right now, which is she says, so often we focus on the war and the fallout of the war. It's interesting to see this angle of it. The Civil War was not as easy as we tend to categorize it. Oh, fabulous. You've got my point directly. And, and hopefully these are ways to help tease out some of the more difficult concepts of the Civil War. Um, I, uh, I was going to save this story for later, but now that you've raised it, you know, my recollection of American history in high school, the only thing I remember about the Civil War is I learned its dates. But I needed ways to tease out the very intricate concepts. And for me, uh, over the course of time, looking at the photographs from the photographic history collection, I've been able to, to learn more. And I'll show you some ways that uh, I've learned to pick out this puzzle. Let me get back to the album. This is again is in Warren's album, and most of this conference has been about Lincoln. Um, so we've taken a, a uh, we've deviated from that in my session a little bit to expand what else is going on besides Lincoln. But Lincoln, of course, is so central to the Civil War and our memory of it, and our visual history of it. So here's President Lincoln, and he's in the middle of Warren's album. Uh, I think it's important to note that Banks came before Lincoln that he was ordered f uh, first. And President Lincoln is here, oh, number 16 in line. And here's Hannibal Hamlin, who was Lincoln's vice president. So I'm going to reiterate the point that Lincoln was incorporated into family albums. Here you have another album. It's a larger carte de visite album with a variety of styles of portraiture. You see that there's hand coloring in the two that are on the lower left. And the, uh, on the left-hand side, the man on the right, you can see the neck brace uh, that's holding his head still. The woman on the right, it's a fantastic portrait of this woman with her book. There's the vignetting. And they've been labeled, fortunately, so we know who these individuals are and that they're somebody's family. Yet four pages over, here we go, we have Lincoln again. And if you notice that this is the same portrait, whoops. Sorry about that. That's okay. Jonathan's jumping ahead. <laughs> Whoop, other way. We need to go back. Okay, we'll go back. I'll take you back. Sorry about okay. that. I was That's so excited okay. about this. <laughs> We're almost there. That's all right. There you are. All right, so there we go. So it's the same portrait of Lincoln. And these two albums did not come in at the same time. They are not related. We'll just stay here, Jonathan. That's fine. Okay. So what I wanted to show you here is that there are... We're scooting ahead for some reason. It's not Jonathan. It's it's the uh, it's the, the the voices of these people in their photos. <laughs> We're being attention. haunted as we speak. Ghosts yeah. in the machine. Okay. There we go. So let's just go one forward. Another one. Oh, the other point I wanted to make with the um, we'll go back just real quickly. The uh, Johnson is labeled next to Lincoln. He's labeled Andy. So there's a real casualness um, with thinking that these are people part of your family and incorporating them in a much more casual way. Okay. All right, there we go. So now I think we're on the right track. So I just wanted to show you these quickly that these are just five loose carte de visites 
that were not in albums, but you can see that it looks like that they're pretty much the same picture. And what would happen in the Civil War is that there was no copyright per se. So one photographer would photograph another photographer's work and then resell it as his own. So in fact, all of these are sold by different individuals. And that point will come up again in just a minute. So I wanted to go back to this, uh, how personal these images are. Truly yours, William H. Hawley, Captain 14th Connecticut Volunteers. Yours truly, George W. Halstead, Lieutenant 10th New York State Volunteers. I don't know if those two guys came back or not, but these two guys did not. They were killed in Antietam. <clears throat> so um, Antietam raises the issue of Matthew Brady, and yes, it is spelled with one T, uh, an important bit to know. Uh, and it was really his picture of Antietam that changed the way the Civil War was viewed. It was the first time that people had seen their own dead uh, from war. And it made a big difference in the way that people began perceiving the war. And that was one of his major contributions. But Brady also was um, instrumental in the commercialism of portraiture. He created Brady's National Gallery. He had a number of studios in New York and here in DC. And people wanted to be part of the National Gallery. So as celebrities would pass through New York, they would come and have their picture made, and he would hang their picture on the wall. And of course, wanting to associate yourself with the grand and the great of, the, of culture and politics and literature and music, you would also want to have your portrait made at Brady's studio. Now, Brady Studios, I should make it plural, Brady actually made very few of the photographs that we see that are identif that are labeled his. He was more of a trademark. And I don't say that in a negative way. I just say that he put his name on many things because he was the overall conceiver of the images rather than necessarily the uh, producer. So he produced the vision for what, uh, produced the vision for documenting so many important individuals and that there was this need to keep record, a visual record, of who was important. We've got a, a number of questions about the logistics of these portraits. Okay. Um, did people have to sit for a very long time uh, to, uh, to take these? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. You know, shortly, with a, photography was patented, not invented, in 1839. And within just a few years, the, the time, the exposure at time really was reduced, but it did depend on the weather and the skill of the photographer and the quality of the materials. So really three or four seconds, but if you're trying to hold still for even 10 seconds, that's an incredibly long time. So here we have Matthew Brady and his famous white coat returning from Bull Run, and there's a date on it, and I believe it says July 22nd, 1861. This is a well-known image of him. If you want a great reference book for Brady, I would recommend the book by Mary Panzer. She's a former colleague and curator at the National Portrait Gallery. So here are some images. I'm going to fly through these, and you can come back to these if you want. I've put them up. These are Brady's portraits of senators uh, before, just right before the Civil War, up, up until about 1858. Uh, and I've brought them out because they are not East Coast based, and they're not Mid-Atlantic based. So we've got uh, people from Missouri and Tennessee and Arkansas and Georgia and Kentucky and Texas and New Mexico and North Carolina. I, I just want to make the point that, that we need to, uh, I, I'm aware that there were um, issues spread out across the country. So I think it, if you have connections with these individuals, uh, feel free to write in and make comments um, in the discussion area how you might use them. Brady, of course, was known for his famous portraits of the generals. And we have about 52 8 by 10 glass plate negatives. And so what you're looking at here are contact prints, scans from the contact prints of the glass plate negative. So between you and Brady, uh, it's only like three steps. This is about as close to um, a Brady negatives, negative as I can get you to. <clears throat> and these are obviously General George Armstrong Custer. And if you happen to have a CDV of one of, these, one of these images, you can compare it and see how much is cropped out and how it's tilted or tinted or the lighting is altered in the printing. Here are four images of General Grant. 
two pictures, these lower two, were probably made at the same time, but the upper two were made at different times in his life. So it might be kind of fun to uh, dissect these images and see if you can put them in order. Here's John Alexander Logan. Brady, of course, photographed people, uh, photographed families. Here's Gal Udette, for whom the university is named after. And I, I wanted to include him because it raises the issue that Lincoln was not only involved in the Civil War, that he was doing other things as well. So during the time of the Civil War, he signed a bill that made uh, what is now Gal Udette University uh, an actual university. And here's Miss Annie strong. And here I just wanted to show you that you can actually see in the lower left-hand corner uh, the glass plate negatives, negative is smaller than the paper. And General Robert E. Lee. This is Robert E. Lee um, as a southern gentleman, not as a defeated general. Brady knew Lee before the war, knew him during the war, knew him after the war, and was able to, because of his friendship, go and photograph him at his home. And he photographs Lee as a dignified southern gentleman rather than as a, rather than, like I said, as a defeated general. And that makes the point that Brady had a specific vision of what the Civil War was. It was a very heroic war, and he presents his, his subjects, whether they're on the battlefield or individuals as heroes, as strong individuals. All right, now we're getting to the fun part of the presentation. I'm going to pause a minute, let you look, let you read, and then I have a question for you. Do you know who Petroleum Vesuvius Nasby was? And we'll let you vote on that and let us know. And then we're going to have another, keep those votes coming in. Oh, fantastic. This is great. I'm so happy to share something with you. I didn't know who he was either before I started this presentation. So <laughs> we get to learn something together. Um, he's a really interesting character. Maybe I've said too much already. But what do you make <laughs> of this text uh, that is underneath his picture? And this is an open-ended question for you. And Jonathan will bring that up for you to type in your answers. Here's a couple of questions. So, yeah, you can you can ask this question in several ways. How do you how would you describe this text? What do you think? Why do you think it was written in this way? And what do you think it means? Great answer, Candace. It's a dialect. Super. We had somebody who thought it was a postmortem picture of somebody who's died. Phonetic spelling, slang, tongue in cheek. Excellent answers. We're going to put all of these up. Uh, we'll post the answers as they keep coming in so you can see. Lack of education, <laughs> Latin. <laughs> yeah, these are great answers. You guys are, you got, there we go. Mocking of fake Southern, poking fun at secession. That's right, he's satirical, he's a writer. And he, um, he was a journalist, and his real name is David Ross Locke, and that's spelled L-O-C-K-E. And he, used, he took on this persona of Petroleum v. Nasby, PM stands for Postmaster, uh, to make a critique as a Union supporter of the South, by making fun of the South, by speaking as a Southerner, as a semi-intellectual, semi intellectual, um, he he, he uses irony and humor to make his point. His letters were often published in newspapers, so if you have access to newspapers of the time or ProQuest, there are tons of materials that pop up. But if you don't have access to those newspapers and you want to read those letters, there is some text at, Gutenb at Gutenberg.org, which is a, a site for free books if you haven't used it before. And so he, at, at that site, they're swinging around the circle, his ideas of men, politics, and things set forth. And here, just to give you a sample of his uh, writing, uh, what it might mean, swinging in the circle by Petroleum V. Nasby, late pastor of the Church of the New Dispensation, um, his ideas and things. You can see how dedication is spelled, and of is U-V instead of O-F, Andrew, A-N-D-R-O-O. -O. You get the point, uh, uh, what his text is writing, and so you can follow up. 
But what I've done is I've taken this a step further, and you can take it a step further even than what I've done. I've used the resources from the Smithsonian Folkways, and there's a recording as read by David Court of a NASB letter. And NASB writes uh, a letter called Wayleth and Cusseth. And it's dated December 26, 1864. And I have set uh, images to the text. Now, I've set images not as illustrations, but as a way to begin to decode the text. So here's my idea, and you can tell me if this, is, if this would work for you or not. So I've put images to the text, and if I were teaching it, I would have students um, take the individuals that are, that are pictured and do research on them to know who they are, what their positions were in the Civil War, have them report back, and then go and read the text again and see how these are all put together. Uh, I mentioned earlier the way that I sort of have come to understand history. For myself, I see history as a puzzle. And there are all these different pieces that need to be put together. And sometimes they're linked and make a bigger picture. And sometimes you take them apart and you still have, um, uh, you still have context and in interesting um, people. So you could study just, for example, you could just study the biography of Lincoln. And that would be pretty interesting. But when you start to put other pieces around him and you begin to build a broader understanding. So that's what I'm trying to do is use this puzzle analogy to um, put the text together, take it apart, take it and put all these pieces together. So um, I muddled that a little bit, but let's see what I've done. Are okay. we ready, Jonathan? Yeah, we'll go ahead and cue the music for folks and uh, you'll hear it in just a second. So this should be about two minutes long. It's actually a four minute piece, but I've cut it down in half. Saints Rest, which is in the state of New Jersey, December the 26th, 1864. I've heard from Savannah. I have read of it. Fancy the feelings of a man who had been for weeks expecting to hear of Sherman's being entirely chawed up by the undaunted Southern militia. The following impromptu cuss and wail, equally mixed, reflects the state of mind of the democracy of this section. Heartsick, weary, alone, busted, gone up, flayed, skinned, hung out, smashed, pulverized, shivered. Scattered, physic, puked, bled, blistered, such is democracy. Alone I sit like Marius among the ruins. Alone I sit and cuss, and this is my cuss. Cuss be Sherman, for he took Atlanta, and he marched through the Confederacy and respected not the feelings of anybody. His path was like Moses, lit with pillars of fire and smoke. Only the fire and smoke was behind him. His path is a desert. Lo, the voice of the Shanghai is heard, not in all the land. And the people in the south lift up their voices and weep because their Negroes are not. And he took Savannah, and cotton enough to satisfy Buchanan's cabinet. And he turns his eyes towards Charleston and is seriously thinking of Richmond. He started with threescore thousand. He stopped with threescore and ten. The wind bloweth where it listeth. He listeth where he goeth. As the lodestone is to the steel, so is his steel to the Georgia Negro. It draweth him on. Who will save us from the fury of this Sherman? Who will deliver us from his hand? Johnston he beat, Hood he fooled, and Wheeler he flung. Lee would do it, but he's holding Grant and can't let go of him. So he cavorts as he will, a yearling mule with a chestnut burr under his tail. Oh, bitter in the mouth of a Democrat is quinine. Bitter as still as gall, but more bitter as federal victories. We have been fed on victories lately, and our stomach turns. Played out as Davis, and democracy has followed suit. The democracy is turning warm, and they're bowing the knee to Lincoln. 
Lindingham will cry aloud for war of extermination, and Fernando Wood will howl for drafts. Although John Brown's body lies all moldy in the grave, his soul is marching on. Now I ain't the Rosa Sharon or the Lily of the Valley. I'm the last of the Copperheads. I built my political house on sand, and it has fell, and I'm under the ruins. Of politics, I wash my hands. I shake its dust off my few remaining garments. Petroleum V. Nasby. Play pass through the church of the It sounds like we had a little skip here in the text. I thought it was going to go back. It sounded like it was doing the last half, but what we really wanted was the front half. Um, so, uh, let's see, there was a question. Let me just go back and say that there was a question about where to acquire this. And I posted the Folkways link here in my presentation. And we'll put that up in the discussion forum for people afterwards so they right. can get that. So what I had done was... Uh, I matched up the text with images and um, I will let you read this to you for yourself as we go forward as I talk for a little bit. Um, but I picked out images of, of individuals who are part of the part of the text with the idea that you could um, let me give you an example right here. We'll stop on, on Douglas. You could look up who is Breckenridge. Douglas is easy to look up. There's a lot of information for who he is and what his relationship to Lincoln is. You see that Lincoln is misspelled here. But if you look up Breckenridge, which is also misspelled, it sh that second E should be an I, you learn that, in fact, there are two Breckenridges that are important in the Civil War. So it's a great discussion to try to decide which Breckenridge it is. The first Breckenridge is the younger of the two, and that is, let me just flip my page, it is John C. Breckenridge, who was Buchanan's vice president. He became a Confederate officer and then later changed his mind and felt that he was going to be, um, be tried for treason, so then he leaves the country, goes to England via, via Cuba, uh, and comes back to be a lawyer. The other Breckenridge is his uncle, who is Robert Jefferson Breckenridge, who, even though he was a slaveholder, opposed slavery. Now, that's an interesting point to discuss, is somebody who holds slaves and yet oppo opposes slavery. So if you, you take just those few individuals and begin to try to build connections across who they are, you begin to try, you begin to enliven and deepen the meaning of Nasby's rant here. Now the other thing that I want to bring up is this issue of post offices to abolitionists. If you remember in the text under Nasby's name, which is written as semi-literate, it's written as a joke, You're, you know that his name, his real name now is David Ross Locke, um, and he says that he's PM, which is a postmaster, and a postmaster was a coveted job, it was a federal position in which you received federal money, but did not have to do very much work. So, NASB, writing as his alter ego here, Locke writing as his alter ego as NASB, who is a Confederate, Nasby's the Confederate, is concerned that he's going to lose his job because of his support of the Confederacy to those of the Union. So that's what which Give Our Post Offices to Abolitionists is about. Um, there was a question, and uh, it's a great question, and leads me right next to the next point I wanted to make, which is, what is the stereo view or the stereograph? You can use either term, they're both correct that is here with heart sick, weary, alone, busted, gone up, flayed, skinned, hung out. Here's an image of what that means. Those are very dramatic words and this is a very dramatic scene. We're going to talk about stereo views in just a little bit, but let me just say about this particular one, this is these are men who are recently dead. And the way you know that they're recently dead is that they still have their guns and they still have their shoes. Um, many photographs that you will see 
uh, will have the it, the soldiers will be missing those things. And I often wonder: Are there letters and are there photographs that are scattered around the field that got left behind? Canteens would have been taken, but certainly not those things that were most precious and dear to the individuals. All right, so we're going to skip back, skip forward to. Let's see, we're here on Douglas. Here are more images. I'm sorry that didn't work out quite the way that I had planned, but that's okay. You can go back and look at these and use these images uh, again and match them up. I was going to pull you about uh, and ask about your opinions about how that would work, and you're still welcome to write that in. I'm not sure it's um, as effective as it was going to be. I think it was very effective. Do you? Okay. It, yes. <laughs> I think you're. I think you're. you're Being you're, hard on the, myself. The comments from people about how powerful oh, that was are, are, are have, were flowing in during the activity. So. Oh, I, okay. I think I think the consensus is it is uh, it would work in the classroom. And oh, great. People were getting right down to the brass tacks of where do I get the uh, the audio and um, and can I use these images? So. Okay. And I did want to make the point. Somebody asked. Uh, no, they th that was a man named David Court who was recording a letter. So it was a dramatic interpretation. Of of the letter. Um, there was no recording in, in 1860. It's not for another 30 or 40 years that we're able to record voices and sound. Great. And you can type your, your ideas and your, uh, in, in the box on the left. And we already have some folks here, for example, uh, LaDonna at Faith School District says, I'm going to use this, um, have them research, and then do a multimedia on it. And a little bit earlier, somebody thought that maybe they would, uh, it was Aaron O'Malley talked about maybe having them do this as a, a video project and post the results to uh, YouTube. There. That's great. Um, the uh, other comment to make is that the liner notes are also available uh, on the web. So you can get the text and know what they are before you, uh, before you actually record the audio from Folkways. All right. I think we are at the activity that I am most excited about and to share with you. We're going to do a compare and contrast with Lincoln's second inaugural address with Obama's inaugural address. And um, let me show you. This is a photograph of Lincoln's second inaugural address. It's full of round heads and hats and things, but right smack dab in the middle, you can see a little white, let me get my clicker here. You yeah. can probably see it for yourself. but. You can see the stand, and there is Lincoln. I'm going to give you a, a detail of it. There he is in the middle. You can see the Lincoln Bible standing right there on the table. And this is the back of the photograph. Now, there's several things to note here about the back of the photograph. Your first question is going to be, what's that smudge on the back? It's actually a transfer, a kind of stain of sorts. So this photograph sat on top of another image, and that image was transferred um, over time. There's a little bit of penciled writing on the top left, and it says that it might be by Brady or an assistant. And in fact, I don't know who wrote that. I don't know when it's dated from. Um, I don't know how true that is. Uh, there's no attribution as to who wrote that. There is a stamp, however, on the back that says Clarence Dodge, and it gives his street address in, here in Washington, D.C. But in fact, doing research, research it is most likely that the photograph was not done by Clarence Dodge, but rather by Alexander Gardner. We're going to talk about him in just a little bit. Again, this is another image. Uh, Gardner and Brady, who photographed the inauguration, did not feel that they should copyright the images of a public event, especially something of the government. And so again, the images were copied and sold under different photographers' names. So here we are. This is not Civil War, obviously, but here is Obama's inauguration. And my uh, fantastic colleague, uh, Dr. Paul Gardulo, is going to talk about some of this. And I think he's going to really enliven your content portion of this compare and contrast. So make sure you stick, stick around and hear what he has to say. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a compare and contrast with Obama and Lincoln and those two photographs. So here are some things to think about. We're going to do it um, in two phases. First, we're going to compare the photograph, and then we're going to compare and contrast the event. So here are some things to think about in terms of comparing and contrasting the photograph. Who was the photographer? What is the date? What are the format, the size, the shape? Who was the user? Who was it intended for? What is the process or the medium? Think of those kinds of questions. So um, let me give you those two photographs together. 
So on the top you have Lincoln and on the bottom you have Obama. And take a look at that. We're going to just move it a little bit over so that you have a space on the right side of the screen to um, offer some comparisons about the photographs themselves, right? Right, exactly. So what do you notice about the photographs themselves? What's, what is similar? What is different about these two photos? And over on the right side of the screen, you'll see a chat box in the lower right corner. That's where you can type in those comparisons. So how about if I start off with one? How about if I tell you that the date of the second inauguration for Lincoln is March 4th, 1865. And of course we know that Obama's was January 20th, 2009. Shannon, if I might say, this is a really sure. powerful contrast of putting these two photos the way you did together. Very, very powerful. Like people are uh, observing that as well. Oh, fantastic. So I'm trying to read some of these. Um, no uh, teleprompters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Security, no glass screens. Um, fantastic. This is. There are lots of good things. There are th simple things that seem so obvious, like uh, one is in black and white and lacks color. The other is in color. Other things that you might note are uh, the... Uh, the, I didn't tell you this, but the bottom photograph of Obama is by is copyrighted by a man named David Bergman. Um, please do not print any of these images from our power our PowerPoint presentation. His uh, email address is at the back of the slides. So there you go. There's another difference right there. He's uh, controlling the image. Lincoln, uh, the gardener, and Brady did not control the image. You can see that there's still wood. The, the Capitol is not constructed yet. Um, people are just jam-packed. People are seated uh, behind Obama. There are all kinds of things that are different. The bottom one is a digital image. The top one is a gelatin silver print. All kinds of those things can be made. All kinds of those um, comparisons and contrasts can be made. If we move to the second part, which is, <laughs> what were you going to say? Uh, Emily points out that the Bible is the same. Exactly. Well, hold on, hold on. You're jumping ahead. That's a great <laughs> point. Thanks, Emily. I'm trying to get you to tease out the differences between the photographs, which are the objects themselves, and the content. It's re it's we we it's so interesting because we know so much, and we understand so much. But to go back and try to do this compare and contrast and make very simple statements, one is a digital image. One, um, even if one is a, a, a paper image, even to say one is old and one is new, to try to really get your head around what the objects are, and then go back and look at the event. What, what's the same about the event? What's different about the event? So let's just change it from photograph to event. Let's, yeah. let's think about the event as an, a moment, an historical moment in time, right. rather than the photograph that we're looking at. Right. So thinking about the photograph for what the subject is, what the content is, what is the message of the photograph. The other, the, the other thing to think about when you are looking at photographs is to really question what your own assumptions are. Now, I happen to think that I'm right much of the time. Um, but I really have to go back and reevaluate what I'm projecting onto the images. What are my own biases? What, what, are, what assumptions am I starting with? Um, and those are really important questions to doing historical studies, especially of photographs. I think photographs are so interesting. We all love them. We're, we're so drawn to them. But we, we don't always have a good visual vocabulary, uh, a good vocabulary for describing what we're seeing visually. And because we see all kinds of different photographs, one of the very first questions you can ask yourself is, what is the function of this photograph? Think of all the photographs that you have right around where you are. You have one in your back pocket that's a picture of your child, your grandma, your aunt, your uncle. That has a very different function than the photograph that's on the newspaper. Um, so begin teasing out what is this photograph about, what is its function, what is its use, mm. will help you really get to the point. All right, we have so much tremendous stuff coming in. Um, Some people are pointing out that, of course, the event itself is the same. They are both inaugurations. Absolutely. Oh. There are, they're both inaugurations. They both are using the Lincoln Bible. That's a great point to make. Thanks, Emily. Um, using that point of the, uh, the Lincoln Bible, what did it mean to Lincoln? What did it mean to Obama? What does it mean to you as a viewer? What does it mean to you as a broad American citizen? What did it mean to the media? 
What did it mean to African American history? There are lots of ways to just ask that one question and answer it from a variety of ways. A good example is uh, Matt's response, who says the topic of race was important in both eras. Yeah, you're exactly right. We're not trying to steal your thunder, Paul. <laughs> We're setting you up, I hope. <laughs> All right, so. We're going to, you'll be able to come back to this and see a lot of the answers so you can draw on what other people have said. But I want to offer you a, um, a virtual handout, as it were, and it's called A Handy Kit for Do-It-Yourself Critics. It's by Ralph Hattersley, who was a, a well-known photography educator. It was published in 1962. It comes from a book called The Education of a Photographer, edited by Charles Traub and others. Um, and where will this be available? It is already posted in the virtual exhibit hall area for the, Ameri uh, the National Museum of American History. Super. So go there, have a look at it. There are fantastic questions for you to ask yourself and to help guide your students in um, assessing all kinds of photographs. I hope that was fun for you. I think it's an, a, a really interesting activity and I really like it because it helps make the connection for me and for others how important it is to study history and how complicated it is that lots of things carry through time, these messages of and stories and issues of race and culture, but then they also have very personal meanings to us as well. Um, one of the things that you have not seen a lot of in my presentation, there are probably a lot of things you haven't seen, but um, one is a lot of Afri images of African Americans or slaves or blacks, and part of that is just that we don't have a lot in our collection. Now I'll share with you, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I will know that I have made my contribution to the photographic history collection because this is one of my very favorite objects. And we're, we're scooting ahead here. Can we go back? We can just go back to the one that has the questions. Oops, other way. There we go. That, can we just hold there? Yep. So what we have here is a, uh, an ambrotype, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, of, um, of a washerwoman for the Union Army in Richmond, Virginia. And what you're seeing is, you saw that she's, it's a cased image, and an ambrotype is a, a wet plate collodion negative, or any negative that happens to be backed by something dark. It could be shellac on the back, it could be a dark piece of fabric or paper, and that negative becomes a positive. Now this is an object that really raises many more questions than it answers. Who is she? Who paid for that photograph? Who possessed the photograph? Why is the flag hand tinted red, white, and blue? Why is she wearing the flag? What does it symbolize? Why is someone who is disenfranchised because of her skin color and her gender wearing a symbol of freedom? This did not happen by accident. This is not a snapshot in any way. This is an enormously considered photographic moment. Uh, she is strong, she's beautiful, she is not cowering in any way. Um, I, I think this is, a, this is an opportunity for fantastic discussion, especially around what does freedom mean and, and who gets to decide what freedom is and what does freedom mean to other people. Uh, what does the flag mean? What did the flag mean to different people during the Civil War? Wow, thank you all for the, the real meaningful uh, insights you're offering here as you begin to try to answer some of these questions and speculate. Yeah, we really don't know the answers. I mean, I, I think it's enormous. Uh, the question of who paid for this photograph is really interesting to me and who owned it and who possessed it. Um, and also it's curious to me that it's it's an ambrotype because the, the ambrotype fell out of fashion by, by like the mid-1850s and here she was supposed to be a washerwoman for the Union Army which is Civil War era why are we sort of going backwards in in terms of photographic process? Not that people weren't making ambrotypes at that time because it certainly was possible and the materials were available, um, but it's curious. And why is this flag hand painted? I mean, that's really a, a significant question. Oh, uh, we have two minutes left. All right, well, <laughs> we went really, uh, this was a fantastic opportunity to show so many images to you. Here's one more that I wanted to show you of the first African-American church in Richmond, Virginia. And those who are really familiar with Richmond, African-American history will probably have something to say about this. Um, this is an interesting image that needs to be decoded. Why are these 
people walking as a group. It's not a procession. They're not just spilling out of the church. Women and children are first in line. This is a, another image that's really ripe for discussion of what was happening at the moment. What were the feelings of the moment? Uh, how did fee people feel about being black and being in Richmond? Did they feel safe being in Richmond? Um, I just want to say that there are other images that we will post that will go with the PowerPoint that we didn't get to that are available for you and for your use. I expanded the whole Warren album is on the back side of this PowerPoint so you can go back and use it. There's a second album that is there that was put together by a man uh, put together in the States for a man in Switzerland. All the text is written in German but it's the major players of the Union Army and then three pages of um, Southern players including John Wilkes Booth and John Corbett, who who shot John Wilkes Booth. Um, so you and also Harriet Ward Beecher is there. So you can begin um, talking about an international interest in uh, in the Civil War using that particular album. All right. So keep those questions coming, and I think we're going to have um, an opportunity to do stuff on, to be able to communicate in the discussion rooms. And please let us know how you use these images, what works for you, and we'll keep this presentation alive. Thanks so much, everybody, for being out there, and I'm so delighted to share the Photographic History Collection with you. Shannon, the response is, is uh, overwhelming. Super. Um, a really uh, fascinating way to, um, to look at images and think about history and to put ourselves at that time. Really uh, a, a very magical lesson. We appreciate it. Um, and um, thank you, everyone, here for sharing your comments. The discussion area is, of course, open and available uh, back on the smithsonianconferences.org site. Just navigate your way to the discussions uh, area and then choose Shannon's session title and jump on in and share some ideas, some reflections. Uh, we'll post um, the slides that Shannon used today with all of these images uh, to the site and more. <laughs> so stay tuned. Uh, the site itself, uh, we hope, will be um, the, the beginning of, the, of sharing around the topics uh, that relate to this conference. So do you continue to come back to it. Um, we'll be back in about seven or eight minutes with a fantastic session, which really will connect so nicely to the one that Shannon just gave. So stay right where you are. We'll be back with you in just a few minutes.